In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today we celebrate the festival of St. Peter and St. Paul. These men were called to be apostles, but were often radically distinct from each other and at odds. So both of them get their own days on other days of the year. The confession of St. Peter on January 18th and the conversion of St. Paul on January 25th. Even those festivals are only a week apart, these two great pillars of the church. Despite their disagreements, the church has taken great pains to show that these two apostles share one confession in one Lord, God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And so tomorrow, and today, I guess, on June 29th, we celebrate these men together. There'll be some more background information for you if you want to read the sounder tomorrow, tell you why this feast day is on this day. But we heard two readings, and I think we ought to take some time to reconcile the two. There's actually, it seems, some distinction between the account given by Peter by way of St. Luke in the Acts of the Apostles of that Jerusalem Council, Acts 15, and also the account given then by Paul to the church in Galatia in Galatians chapter 2. We did hear what the source of the controversy was about. So Paul, if you know, had circumcised Timothy, who was, of course, a Jew, uh, raised by his mother and uh, mother Eunice, right, and Lois, who was his grandmother. So he had been circumcised, as, even as a Christian. Um, but Titus, on the other hand, as we heard, Paul did not circumcise, and this caused no end of controversy even uh, wherever Paul was, because very often the first to convert to the Christian faith, the confession of Christ, were the Jews. And as with any kind of strongly held tr tradition or practice, they die hard. <laughs> they don't go away, not easily, even if they have now been abrogated and eliminated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we heard about all the ceremonial laws of Moses, and even James, in his uh, farewell speech there at the end of the council said, well, they should still keep some of the laws of Moses, if not circumcision, you know, fasting from, uh, uh, from blood and certain meats and this sort of thing. But the center point, the central controversial point was at that point of circumcision, which was the chief mark of one being part of the old covenant. Remember, it was given first to Abraham. And it was instantiated for all the people of Israel under Moses from Sinai. So then the question is, what about Christians? Now, I suppose we could talk about all the medical um, questions that surround circumcision, whether it's good or bad, and what's you, what they use the, the cutting for and all of that. But here, that circumcision mark was put at the very point where the promised Savior would come by way of the fathers and then their sons. So the promise given to Abraham and then to Isaac and to Jacob was of an offspring, a son, the same son that was promised to Adam and Eve, the son that would crush the serpent's head. So they were always looking forward to their sons. Perhaps this son is the son of the, that would be the Messiah. And especially as we come to David and the promises repeated to David of a son who would reign as king forever, whose throne would be eternal. Again, David looked to his sons to be the fulfillment of that promise, Absalom being quite the disappointment, Solomon being the one of the lineage of Jesus. And so circumcision was pointing forward to Jesus. But now that Jesus has come, it is no longer necessary. Salvation has come. And there, Jesus actually inst institutes a new covenant, a covenant or a testament in his blood. The blood shed at his cross, given to us to drink in the supper, washed upon us in our baptism, that blood that forgives us our sins. And so circumcision was no longer necessary, at least not religiously speaking, and not mandated for Christians. And as Paul was working among the Gentiles, he didn't even bother having them circumcised then. Why would they need to submit to this sign of a covenant that has been fulfilled in Jesus? And never mind all the rest of the laws of Moses. 
So some taught that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved, as we heard, Acts 15.1. So this caused no, no small dissension, according to St. Luke, among the apostles and the pastors, or the elders as they're called, Paul and his companions, whether it's Barnabas or the others. So they have a council, and this is what you do when there is a dispute, whether it is over doctrine or practice. The church gets together, and they, well, they try to hash it out. So Peter and the rest of Jerusalem called Paul and Barnabas to give an account of their experiences. The first point that they need to demonstrate to the council is that the work that they're doing is according to God's mandate and design. And so Paul gives testimony to the way that uh, the Gentiles had received the word of the gospel, were converted, were baptized, and had received the Holy Spirit just as they had. Clearly, God was at work amongst Paul with his companions. Even these non-believing Pharisees got involved in the council, demanding that they submit, Christians submit to the law of Moses. But you'll remember what Paul said and asserted was what actually saved the Gentiles. It was by hearing that Jesus Christ was crucified for the forgiveness of their sins. They were saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. And believing, they were baptized and received the Holy Spirit, just like the pillars of the church, that was James and Cephas and John, had received at Pentecost. Paul makes this really dramatic assertion when he says that there is now no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And elsewhere, he'll say, between the circumcised and uncircumcised, even between slave and free, but that Christians are saved by faith in Jesus' saving blood alone. But that's mostly all given to us from Peter's account in uh, Luke's Acts of the Apostles. Paul adds more background from his account to the when he writes to the church in Galatia. He tells us that he had been working amongst the, Galatians, amongst the Gentiles, I should say, for 14 years. But during that time, false Christians had infiltrated the church. A practice that's hard to hear is possible, but it, it did, and it does even today. They come in by stealth, and what, what is their objective? What, what might we be on guard for? They spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us again into bondage. There's nothing more offensive to the old Adam than the freedom of the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, as far as a religious offense would go. The old Adam, the flesh, wants nothing to do with a gift and wants everything to be about work. Whether it's merit or demonstration of faith or all the different manifestations. Bondage, slavery, do this, do that, and you'll be saved. Instead, here comes Paul saying, you are saved by grace, God's giving alone. And he even gives you the faith to believe it. All as gift. Freedom, not bondage. So this really isn't an insignificant matter. Paul really gets after the heart of it. It's not just about some external practice about circumcision or even just the language of Old Covenant and New Covenant. And maybe you can kind of have a halfway position where you do the laws of Moses and you believe in Jesus or something. Well, that's not possible. This was not an insignificant matter. He says that these are, to coin a phrase, theological terrorists who were trying to undermine the freedom of Christ's forgiveness by demanding that Christians submit again to the law of Moses. And so he said, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we could bear? Now it's not circumcision or uncircumcision that's the point. Paul had already treated that as an indifferent matter in regards to both Titus and Timothy, one circumcised, the other not. But the gospel of forgiveness in Jesus is attached very specifically to preaching, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. And that's the thing that matters. The law, the preaching of do this and you will live, the law of Moses, Paul rightly says was a yoke that we couldn't even bear. It always accuses. It always shows us our sin. It never sets us free. It only puts us further and further under bondage. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness 
is true freedom. So now, I think Paul rightly recognizes that the conflict isn't just over a matter of what meats we eat or which laws we follow or whether we do this medical procedure that was a sign of something in the past. Paul rec rightly recognizes the conflict is between faith and unfaith, believing and unbelieving. As Paul tells us, for God, who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. See, circumcision and uncircumcision isn't the thing. It's God working through his chosen instruments to preach the gospel, to deliver sinners from their sin and into the freedom of Christ. So he demonstrated the conversion of the Gentiles as they heard the word of the gospel, were baptized, received the Spirit. And so James, Peter, or as he was called there, Cephas and John, extended the right hand of fellowship and endorsed his work to the uncircumcised Gentiles. Notice they, he didn't stay long in Jerusalem, though. They probably still didn't get along all that well. Maybe were even a little suspicious of Paul, given his background. But this is the only way for anyone, and I would say even for our Christian congregation, even amongst individual Christians, to reconcile. It's not to just agree to disagree, not to ignore the differences, not to set them aside and forget or act as if they don't matter, but rather to drill down and find what, well, what truly does matter, to speak frankly and openly about what we believe. And then to determine, is this practice contrary to what we confess, or does it support what we confess? Can it be set aside, or is it something that Jesus actually instituted that we must do in order to be saved, like baptism, for example? Have that conversation and reconcile. So as we put all these accounts together, and maybe even add some other experiences, like the one that Peter had, remember where there was that cloth or that curtain that came down from heaven. It was a vision. And on it were all sorts of animals. And Jesus told Peter that there was now no distinction between clean, unclean and clean foods, which Peter rightly understood meant that there was now no distinction between Jew and Gentile. We can see that there really then is no great divide between the ministry of those pillars of the church, James, Peter, and John, and Paul. Or even just between the two that we recognize this day, Peter and Paul. Not so different after all, despite their backgrounds, despite um, who they were sent to minister to, they actually share one confession, one faith. After their larger-than-life egos and their old grudges, their dead traditions, and even that heavy dose of skepticism about Paul, that former persecutor of the church, after all that was set aside, they finally found agreement in the preaching of the law and the gospel faithfully, and the giving of the gifts of Jesus as he has instituted them. And of course, that is what they determined at the Jerusalem Council for us, still our confession today, that we agree on the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. That's all that is necessary for true unity in the church. Everything else, well, it's window dressing. And thus, we can celebrate these two men together, these two apostles, one to the Jews and the other to the Gentiles. And as tradition has it, they were both interred beneath the original St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And now together they await the joyous resurrection that they fearlessly proclaimed together. May God give us the same sort of faith that we can reconcile in Christ, majoring in the mi not in the minors, but in that which Jesus has given the confession of the gospel and forgiveness that it gives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand.